First, let me just say a few things. The biggest obstacle to uh, doing practice is our own expectations. Every time we sit down, we think something's got to happen. But believe me, nothing ever happens. <laughs> so just get over it, and then everything will be okay. If you don't have expectations, you'll be perfectly happy. So when, you, when we do our practice, it's just simply be there with it. You know, don't be ambitious and aggressive. Don't try to make anything happen. It already happened. We're here. That's the big mistake that we made. <laughs> so, here we are. <clears throat> Maharaj used to say to us, Ram Nam Karna Se So Pura Ho Jata Hai. Someone's got me. From going on repeating these names of God, everything is accomplished. From going on repeating all these names, everything is accomplished. Everything is brought to fullness. Our good karmas are ripened, our negative karmas are destroyed, and we, we enter into the flow of grace. <clears throat> so when we, when we chant, I share this practice the way I do it, okay? Everybody, everybody who chants has their own uh, version of it. I simply sing, and when I notice that I've been gone, daydreaming, fantasizing, remembering, blah, 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 I come back, back to the sound of the name. The sound of the name. The sound is the sound form of what's beyond form which is who we are, our own true essence. So, it's not about anything. So when you sing, you just simply keep coming back, again and again and again. And little by little, over time, we get more familiar with being here and not being gone, because basically we spend most of our lives completely gone, living in dreamland, thinking about this, reacting about that, planning this, fighting this, dreaming this, blah, 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 all that, and we're never here for a moment. We get born, we go to high school, we drink some beer, and we die. That's most of our lives. And if not our lives, go to a supermarket and look around. There's nobody home. So, these practices bring us back to our true self, to us. The, that being lives within us as who we are, not as something else. Okay? It's not something we can, we have to manipulate our emotions to feel, get some, get a little hit of little bliss, a little ecstasy. No. It's who we are. So we just keep coming back. You let go, you come back. You let go. But here's the thing. You're gone, okay? We're singing. And then you go, oh, you realize you've been thinking about you know, catching up on the Sopranos or something. <laughs> How did that moment happen that you noticed you were gone? Think about that for a second. Boom, that's a second. How did that moment happen that you noticed you were gone? We didn't do that. We were gone. We were asleep. We, you can't wake yourself up when you're asleep and we never set the alarm. How did that happen, that we're dreaming, 
we're singing, we're hearing people sing, but we're really gone. How did it happen that we noticed that we were gone? Aha! Uh -huh. So, this is the idea of cause and effect. Nothing can happen without a cause, right? And then, okay, so nothing... So what could be the cause of waking up? Waking up is the only cause of waking up. It's our own efforts in the past of cultivating, remembering, whatever, the name, ourself, the moment, mindfulness, whatever you want to call it. It's our own efforts in the previous moments that allowed that moment to happen. That's really big time. So when that happens, notice it, and then the next thing you do, you come back to the sound of the name. That's all that's required. Nothing more is required. Everything you need to know and experience will come from inside when we are ripe enough. This is a ripening process. It's not a learning process, it's a forgetting process. We have to forget everything we think we know, so we can actually be. The sound of the name. And all the names are the same. That's what I say. Other people might say something else. But all the names are Maha Mantra. And also Hanuman Chalisa is Maha Mantra. Maharaji said that himself. He said, every word, every line of Hanuman Chalisa is Maha Mantra. And that practice was given to us by Maharaj, of course, in his own way. It never looks like he never does anything and then everything happens. So that's his blessing to us, is the Hanuman Chalisa. Hanuman Chalisa can change fate. At least that's the way it was translated. It probably meant it could remove negative karmas from our karmic flow. He said that. But that's, that can't be the motivation for doing it, necessarily. But it happens when we open our hearts. Can I make the mic closer to me? Exactly. How is this? What would I do without her? Never mind. Did you hear a word I said? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. Let's do questions. I'm finished with that shit. If you have something to say, raise your hand and then duck. Jackie, we have two microphones, right? Okay. Go ahead, Jackie. Kevin Jones, can you give Say what? It's on. Yeah. So the person who gave me their question in the lunchroom that I have in my pocket. Do you, you, do you want to ask the question yourself? Okay, just keep this. Hey, Katie. Um, I am from here in North Carolina, and we are very predominantly Christian. Um, I was raised Southern Baptist, and I have found where I'm at in my path, but I feel like my path has been really stagnant for several years. And my real question is, um, this is what I had topped to give to Nina, but other religions are strongly prevalent in my area, along with family and friends, that those, they are beliefs as well. How can I get past the judgment of others with different beliefs? Um, I, I just feel really stuck in that. I, my business is, I, would, I feel like I would lose a lot of customers because where I live to say I believe I'm Buddhist, and I'm just, I'm kind of stuck with friends and families how to deal with that mindset. Well, the problem or the situation is that what you're identifying yourself with, you're not a Buddhist, you're a human. So if you treat other people like human beings and don't wear a, a you know, write Buddhist on your forehead and smile and lie, everything will be fine. <laughs> Yeah.
And just say, praise the Lord. I learned a lot in North Carolina. I remember one time when I was touring down here, <clears throat> my friend was playing bass with me, and uh, we were buying some coffee somewhere on the road, and he was telling me this dirty joke, right? Right as we were paying for the coffee, and I saw that the woman behind the cash register had heard us, so I said, oh, I'm really sorry. We're just, you know, we're just, we're so, I'm sorry. And she said, oh, that's all right. I know how to say fuck you. My grandmother taught us, taught us how to say that down here. I said, I said, what do you mean? How do you say it? She said, isn't that nice? <laughs> Got it? Just smile and say, isn't that nice? <laughs> you learn your lessons. But seriously, uh, you know, um, you don't have to project yourself as a member of any particular religious cult. You know, just be you and treat people eye to eye, nose to nose. And Religion, real religion, is love. Not me and you. It is one. So you're making the problems, not them. So if you're making the problems, you can unmake the problems. Next victim. <laughs> hi, KD. Ram Ram. Ram Ram. Nice to say hi to you. Hold on. It's um, not in here. Oh, hi. All right, now I'm okay. Um, my question is, I, the problem is I read this on Wikipedia, that some people think that Maharaji was born, whatever that means, but I guess as Lakshman Das or something, um, on December 22nd, and I noticed that Ram Das passed away on that day. Is this something people talk about, that he might have passed away on the day Maharaji was born, or is this not really a consideration? You know, this is how religions start. <clears throat> Maybe we can end it right now. Forget about it. Next. Hello? Yeah. So... Kev, louder, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question regarding everyday issues we face, like at times we are happy, we are, we are happy and things go wrong, we become sad. But spiritual practices which like makes us feel calm, nice, free of anxiety. But still at times that doesn't work when things are happening to us. So, I mean, mind keeps on going back and forth. So I don't know, maybe you can yeah. help. You don't, you don't see what's going on inside your head until you try to meditate. It's always there, it's always crazy like that, but you never saw it before. And spiritual practice isn't about feeling good all the time. It's not even about trying to feel good, it's trying to be present and be aware. But you, you want to feel good. The third patriarch of Zen said, the great way is not difficult for those with no preferences. So, all we have is preferences, so we're totally fucked. So get over the, you can't get over the preferences, but be aware that you're clinging to wanting some particular feeling. And that's not necessary. That's the only issue. You're judging, you're evaluating, instead of paying attention. So pay attention to the, be aware of the judger and the evaluator, and the one who feels like it ain't working. You're there all the time. You have, we have to get into that, we have to keep releasing the thoughts and the emotions and the programs that we unconsciously believe our whole life long. But we have expectations. You think you're going to sit down and pretend to meditate and then everything's going to be great. No. 
you're going to recognize how ungrade it is. And that's very useful. So, like I said at the beginning, it's our expectations that, that create the tension in us and pretty much stop us from continue getting a regular practice going, because regular is very important. Uh, even if it's just two minutes, you sit down, don't do nothing. First of all, it's very hard to do nothing. But to be aware, just to sit down and stop trying to get away from yourself, just be there every day. Just remember to do that for a minute or two. Eventually you get used to letting go, because being here feels better than being gone. Well, maybe, maybe not. Being here is where we are. And then you notice you're gone, and when you notice you're gone, you're not gone anymore, you're present. You can't hold on to that presence, because it's deeper than who we think we are. We can, only we can do is keep letting go, and noticing when we're gone, letting go and coming back. Little by little, we spend more time at home, in ourself. And the name has, a, has shakti in it, just like a, a little seed can have a whole tree. So does every repetition of the name carry this essence and this seed that will grow over time. So every repetition of the name is planting a seed, because every thought is planting a seed. So if we're thinking about shit all day long, we're planting shit seeds, which we do all the time. So let's plant some name seeds, because that's good. And that leads us to becoming more aware and more kind, because when we see how difficult it is to do that, we stop judging others so much. When we see how difficult it is to be a good human being and treat people well, and deal with our own stuff, then we can begin to see other people in a much more compassionate light, which is very important. Hi, uh, my name is Omkari. Um, could you speak a little bit about um, going beyond your attachment to your guru's physical form? I, I'm struggling with that a little bit in my personal life. Excuse yeah. <clears throat> well, I met Maharaji when I met Ramdas, when I walked into the room where Ramdas was sitting for the first time, when I went up to see him in New Hampshire. The minute I walked into that room, the minute I walked into that room, the minute I walked into that room, uh, something happened inside of me, and I knew Immediately, I understood that whatever it was I was looking for in the, was real, and it was in the world, and you could find it. And that changed my life. And that was Maharaja. And it was totally fine until I went to see him, and then it all got screwed up. And I lost that awareness, and I got totally attached to him, his physical body. Which was great fun, until it wasn't there. Then that was not fun. And I suffered a lot. You're just going to suffer until you give up the attachment. Because the love you're looking for was never out there. Even when you were with your guru, where did you feel the love? In his foot or in yourself? And that's where it is. But you just lost the, uh, the drug that you were taking at the time. 
So you just suffer until you let go of it, that's all. There's no, way, no quick way. On the other hand, you can enjoy that suffering because that's the connection also. So really just mope around, you know, and enjoy it. <laughs> it's so good. I don't mope as much as I used to, so sometimes I do it just for fun. It's so real and rich and juicy. So it won't last, don't worry. Guru is not outside of us, never was, never will be. We see, we see a body that's so beautiful, that has all that light in the universe and all the beauty and love wrapped up in that body. Of course we fall in love with it. That's why they, that's why they do that, to pull us out of ourselves and give us a hit. And then they disappear, and so we can find it inside of us. It's very rare that uh, well, it's, it's not so often that you, you, you... When you're with the Guru, it's just too easy to, to, uh, to get lost in that. But of course, there's nothing like it. So, I mean, it's the greatest thing in the universe. But uh, like everything else, bodies come, bodies go. Maharaj used to say, Ram has gone, Krishna has gone, but their name remains. And so the name of the Guru, which is the name of his, his true being, or her true being, that's still here. And that's the connection through the name. Name is a big mystery. It's not just like yada yada. It's a real mystery, a bona fide mystery. St. John of the Cross said, In the beginning the Father uttered one word, that word is his son, and he utters him forever in everlasting silence. And it is in silence that the heart must hear. The name, the real name is silence. Not absence of sound, but being. The, the, the space in which everything exists is silence. That's the name. There's no beginning and no end to it. You know, he used to say, go ahead, sing your lying false Ram Ram. One of these days you really call out and the real Ram will come. But don't stop, keep singing the lying Ram Ram, which is what we're doing. Because through the repetition of the name, Everything is accomplished, whatever that means to you, and more than what it means to us, actually. Because we can only conceive of things conceptually in our minds. Beyond that, we don't know. But the name is beyond that. Our true nature is beyond that. And yet, within us, and here all the time. It's only our thoughts and our attachments to those identities and programs that separate us from that. That's all. Hi, Katie. Thank yep. you. Um, for your presence here. Um, my nine-year-old son met you last time in Maui, and every time he loses an argument, he threatens to call you to be the tiebreaker. <laughs> so now you're a method that he has stuck to. Uh -huh. um, my question for you today is, um, I wanted to see if you could share some insight from your own experience in how to take these practices um, and start introducing a nine-year-old to it, and what did you do with your own daughter, and how did you introduce these practices to her? I didn't. I just did them. The pictures are up all around the house. She couldn't get away from it. We never, I never pushed her to do anything. 
<clears throat> you know, we used to sing at Raghu's house on Saturday nights at one point when we all lived near each other. And the kids would be running around playing all the time. The minute we started to sing Devik and Nandan Gopala, Janaki would run into the room, put her head on her mother's lap and fall asleep. Just be a good person. It's love that's the whole thing, not, not this or that. And you want, you, as long as your child feels loved and accepted for what he is or she is, that's a good place to start. You don't have to initiate him into any cult. That would be the worst thing he ever did. But you try to show him how to be a good person, which means you have to be a good person. You know, because he'll see everything you do. He'll see when you lose your, your shit and scream at somebody. And he'll learn that too. So it's up to you to do your best, and then he can do his best. And tell your son I just changed my number. Krishnaji, Nam. My name is Kapil. Spoke to you yesterday. I Put the mic closer. Yeah. Hello, 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 hello. Can everybody hear me? I am Kapil. I wanted to see if you could talk about Casey Tewari ji, Baba, to you. After you lost your guru, how, how did he, what did he do for you? And what was that relationship? Whatever you would like to share, please. Because when you published that documentary about his samadhis and the states that he would go into, I played that documentary for 21 days, every day, and that was my sadhana, just watching him. So please talk about him. It would be very kind to me. Thank you. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, uh, he's talking about Mr. K.C. Tiwari, who was a, a lifelong devotee of Maharaji's. Uh, when Maharaji first showed up in the mountains, Tiwari was about eight years old, and uh, he would play with the kids. To, he would do all kinds of somersaults. He, would put, he could put his arms on the ground and do a complete somersault without picking his arms up and then the kids would feed him. That's how he got his food. One time he, he ate Tawari's lunch and Tawari slapped him, so Maharaji slapped him back. <laughs> That's when he was eight years old. And then Maharaji disappeared for a while, came back. Finally, when he came back later on, uh, Tawari was older and um, began to spend time with Maharaji. Oh, he was a great yogi, really, and he didn't promote himself at all. Uh, in fact, well, the day that Maharaji left Kenchi to go down to the plains, and then he left his body on the train, uh, at the train station in Agra, in uh, Mathura. But the day he was going to leave, he called, he put Tawari in a very, very deep state. And then, have you seen, the, have you seen any of the, the, the video of Maharaji? There's this one video where it looks like he's hitting Tawari on the head. He's actually bringing him back. He was gone in Samadhi, he's bringing him back. He's laughing and he's hitting him on the head, grabbing his head like this. So then they went inside the back room and Maharaji reaches into his blanket and he pulls out a huge wad of money. And he throws it to Tuari. He says, take this money, go to America. You're the guru now. Take care of the Westerners. So Tuari began to cry. And he said, I don't come to you for this. And I won't do it. I won't do it. I won't take it. And so Maharaji takes the money back, puts it back under his blanket. He said, okay, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. So then Tuari kind of collected himself and he said, he said to Maharaji, Oh, now I see what kind of a Baba you are. Carrying money in your blanket. You're a money Baba. So Maharaji kind of says, Oh, you want to fuck with me? And he opens his blanket like this, and hundreds and hundreds of little pieces of paper fall out. 
And he says, see, I'm old now, I can't remember my, the names of my devotees, so I have it written on these tiny little pieces of paper. But you saw money because you're a miserable, greedy fucker. <laughs> that kind of, that's the way they talk to each other. I don't know if that's a direct quote. But, so anyhow, Tawari was really extraordinary. We would go on these long drives around India, these pilgrimages. <clears throat> and you know, we'd be driving down the road, we'd see a Shiva temple. So he, we would have to pull the car off the road, you know, and then he'd go running into the temple, and I had to go with him. I remember one time, we went into this little temple, and there was like a, like a foot of water on the floor. And he gets right down into the, you know, and starts doing puja to the lingam, and I have to sit in his water with all these creepy crawlies. It was just horrible. But uh, it was fun. Um, he was, uh, Tuari had been, his parents died when he was young, and he was raised by an aunt who also died when he was pretty young, so he had taken a vow not to marry. And um, so one day, Maharaji and Tuari were traveling around, and they came to this house in Haldwani. It was the house of one of his devotees who had died. The man, the, fa the father had died. The mother had died long ago, and the father uh, had just died. And everybody was being taken care of, all the other family, by the youngest daughter. So Maharaji and Tuari, they came in and they went to sit in the living room. And this young woman came in and brought them water and fruit and this and that. And Maharaji says to Tuari, Hey, she's really beautiful, huh? Tuari says, like this. He, he, wouldn't realize. he says, she's really beautiful, you know. I think you should marry her. Tuari says, you know I've taken a vow not to marry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But she's really beautiful. He says, and then he says to her, you know, she's actually Joan of Arc. <laughs> what? That's why I was just... So finally said, <clears throat> so Maharaj says, okay, we're not leaving until you agree to marry her. And then Tuari says, then we're staying here forever because I won't marry. And they argue for two days. Finally, Tuari says, okay, if you write on the marriage certificate, I, Neem Karoli Baba, take full responsibility for all issue from this marriage and sign your name, then I'll marry her. Hup, I won't do that. Good, then I won't marry. Another day went by and finally Maharaji gave up. He said, okay, I'll write that. I've seen it. I, Neem Karoli Baba, take full responsibility. And then on the day of the marriage, it was taking place at the top of the hill in Nanital at the school. And uh, Maharaji came up the mountain and about halfway, and Tuari ran down to be with him, and he was sitting with him, and they were sitting for a long time, and he's all dressed up in the, the groom, dressed up in this whole thing, you know? And he's sitting there, and finally somebody says, Baba, you're, you're keeping this guy here. The marriage is supposed to go on. So Maharaji looks at him and said, yeah, ciao, go. So he, otherwise, he wasn't going to go. So, okay, I'll tell you something I don't usually say publicly. So, Tuari was so great. We could tell him everything, you know, the Westerners. And I, I shared everything with him, everything about my life. And one time we were talking about sex and this and that, and we're talking about this. And he looked at me and he said, you know, my boy, he said, I didn't have samadhi for the first time until after I was married. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> yeah. He, uh, when we brought, he came to America a few times. And it was ridiculous, it was so funny. We'd be walking along with him down the street, and all of a sudden, we'd look back, and a half a block gone, he's like... 
I'm just standing there in samadhi. We have to go pick them up and carry them around, you know. It was really great walking around, though. One time, he had a bursitis in his elbow, his shoulder. So he wanted to see an acupuncturist. <clears throat> My acupuncturist had an office in Chinatown, in the city, New York, but he wanted to be more available to people. So he decided to get an office in Midtown Manhattan. For him, that meant 42nd Street, which back in the 80s was porn city. And so, so to our, I wanted to bring him to the, the, the doctor. So we parked on 8th Avenue. We had to walk for two blocks to the doctor's office. And there's Mr. and Mrs. Tuari, we're walking along, you know, and people are coming up and saying, offer drugs and this and what do you have and this and you know, and we're passing the movie theaters with the porn shows and the porn movies, you know, and I'm going, oh shit, I should never have brought them, this is so horrible. And I said, Baba, and then Mrs. Tuari says something. She goes, you want to get up? I said, Baba, what did she say? Figuring she probably said, Krishna, I shouldn't have taken us here, what an asshole he is, right? So I said, Baba, what did she say? He said, oh, she said this is heaven. <laughs> right. I said, heaven? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, of course, heaven is a place you go to get the things you want. <laughs> wow. And they really, they had no, no, hello, yes, point, no, thank you, yes, okay, boop, boop. No problem. Living with them was just so wonderful. I, you know, I've said, it was a functional family. Who knew? Who knew there was such a thing? They could yell and scream and everything, but nobody was afraid that anyone would throw them out of their heart. Love was never in question, whether you were yelling or not yelling, or angry or not angry. It, everything was okay. It was unbelievable. And Tuara used to like to piss me off. Oh, it was. He would say something, it just, and I, and he'd look at me and go, you will fire upon me now? He just wanted a party. We used to scream at each other, nose to nose, about spiritual stuff. What do you mean, Satra is just another guna? You know, stuff like that. You know. we have, it was so great. You could say, I could say anything to him about anything. It was really wonderful. And I would never get, I'd get, always got the bottom line back. Never any judgment, never any, like, you know, any closing down. Just openness and kindness and, and, reality, because he saw things from a very deep, deep place, you know. He would wake up, we'd, when I was staying with him, I would, he and I would sleep in the big bed and Ma would sleep with the kids. He would wake up about 3.30, go pee, and come back to bed, cross his legs, sit up, boom, gone for like four or five hours until everybody woke up. I would wake up, watch him go pee, turn over and go back to sleep. <laughs> and I, not once, I can't even believe it, but not once in 20 years did I ever say to him, uh, could you teach me how to meditate? Not once. He was waiting for me to ask, I'm sure. But I was so, whatever. How, do you, how, how does that happen? Crazy. He, 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 he knew how to do stuff. He, could, he put me into samadhi a couple of times. Once during a puja and once from the hotel room next door to mine. <laughs> I was in, my girlfriend and I were in one room and I went to sit and the kundalini started to come up and I was like, <coughs> I was choking, you know, I couldn't breathe. <coughs> so she ran next door to, and he, he just went, he didn't even let her say anything. He said, don't worry, everything okay, go. And I'm like, ah, 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 
<laughs> Ramda said the same thing happened to him with, with Maharaji. Kundalini came up and he got stuck in the throat. And then Maharaji said, oh, he's not ready. He's like that. He was big time, really special being. What? Could he make me stop breathing? breathing. Grieving? Breathing. Huh? Okay, wait. One person, please. You. What do you say? Huh? Free base. Free base. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, I was, I was addicted to free-based cocaine for about just under two years. And um, Tawari came to America. Actually, he was at Sunanda's house. Sunanda, you were there. I don't think she's here. She doesn't want to hear me talk. She's here. Oh, yeah. So he came to Canada to Sunanda's place up in Canada. And I, I was living in California. So I flew to New York. And I spent the night in my father's apartment smoking bass. And then I got up in the morning and I flew to Canada. I drove out to the farm. And um, he, was in a, he was sitting in a room with Sunanda. And his back was to the door. And I walked up to the door. And as I got close to the door, I felt like this force field. And I, Literally, I kind of stopped and was like backing away. And he stood up and he turns and he looks at me and he goes, You, promise me now you will give up cocaine. Promise me now. So I said, Okay. <laughs> and from that moment to this moment, gone. And I don't know if you know, it ain't easy to give up base. It would never came into my mind, and if it did, it was just a pile of coke, a pile of poop. Hmm, poop looked better. Just gone. They've, he and Maharaji, they just saved me. I was going down. I would not be here, guaranteed. And more than that, if I had to fight with that desire all these years, I wouldn't have won. But they took it away. So. You got to get the mic. I have, give them two rupees, they'll give you the mic. Um, KC Tarari, what does the KC stand for? Krishna Chandra. Krishna Chandra? Ch Chandra, Chandra, yeah, Moon, Chandra. What does that mean? Moon. It's a, a family name. His son was S.C., his other son was N.C., Nirmal Chandra, Sharad Chandra. It was part of, it's a family name, a lineage. Namaste. We are so good about seeking things that serve us, you know, take care of us. And if you look at self-care, self-improvement. It's a $1.5 trillion industry. Um, but how much of this work on self is about service to others? Because if you look at Hanuman and what, who he is and his essence, it was really about service to others. And in all of your books, you talk about how you know, one of the first things Maharajji did was feed people. Mm -hmm. And that was... <clears throat> Something that happened a lot in the ashram, even to this day, I believe you can go to the ashram and get fed. Something. Uh, and, it's, and it's part of our culture also in India, yeah. where we're very good about that. But yeah. we forget that, I think, um, For sure. at some point in our life. So how important it is, is it to focus on service to others versus focusing on self? Well, first of all, ultimately, there's no difference. Ultimately, in reality, there's, no, there's only one self. 
in reality. We're all a part of that. But Western egos are very different than Indian egos. We're Eastern egos. We're brought up a different way. We see ourselves differently. And um, many of us have a lot of emotional issues that are very different than Indians' mo emotional issues. It's just slightly, it's a different way of seeing the world, really. Basically, you grow up in families that are usually pretty cool, for the most part. There's a lot of love in those families. I don't think it's the same here. In fact, one time I was sitting in the back of the temple with Siddhima, and all of the cousins of the Tuari family, like 20 kids, they all came because the oldest grandchild was going to get married. So they came to be with Ma and get blessings. So they're sitting, and I'm sitting looking at these kids. There was so much love and affection between these kids. I was just staring at them like this. And Ma looked at me and she laughed and she said, You see, Krishna Das? You see what you missed by being born in America. <laughs> so it's not the self, the self thing is, of course, it's misunderstood, but it's not a bad thing. Western, we Westerners are so full of self-hatred and self-loathing and we, have so, we feel so unable to, to, to feel good. We've lost so much touch with that place inside that's okay. In some ways we really need to re-establish a little bit of that in order to move forward. And um, if you're starving to death, you really can't feed anybody. So one has to learn first to feed oneself and then to recognize that everybody's hungry. So why not share a little bit? But for the Westerners, it's really important to think about how to take care of ourselves because we're not brought up that way. <laughs> I guess you agree. Jackie, you go next, but I just, somebody had a follow-up question with the story of KC Tiwari. Okay. They didn't understand what you meant by the Kundalini, the experience that you had and all that, so. Well, I don't understand it either. I, they say that there's a energy that, that ultimately at some time comes up through the central channel in the spine. There's two nadis on, on, the, on the left and the right, the, the sun and the moon channels. And then at some point, the, all that energy that flows through the body comes into those two channels and then it gets into the central channel and comes up and kind of bang, you know, like at a state fair, you, you hit the thing and it goes up like that. And then when the Kundalini rises like that, that's one aspect of uh, some kind of spiritual something or other. But anyway, it didn't last, so forget about it. <laughs> and you can't make it happen anyhow. If you do, then you get stuck thinking that you made it happen. And that's really bad. And you never get over that. So, when one is ready, you know, the other thing I, I once said to Ma, I said, Ma, you know, should I sing or should I meditate? I was really, you know, and she, she, she said, well, what do you like to do? Hello. It never occurred to me that doing what I like would be good for me. That's because my mother told me it wouldn't. So uh, she said that in 40 years with Maharaji, not once did he ask her to meditate. He asked her to do japa, re repetition of the name. And he said to her, the, the more subtle states of consciousness will arise naturally when the heart becomes pure and clean. And the way to clean the heart is the repetition of the name. 
he, he said, those states will, you can't, he said, you can't bring about those deeper states of consciousness through the personal will, through our own personal will. I'm going to meditate myself right into oblivion. It won't work. But if once we, we clean our hearts and purify our hearts and open our hearts and develop what they call bodhicitta, which is kindness and compassion for ourselves and others, then those deeper states of consciousness will arise naturally. And one, one in some traditions or lineages, the Kundalini is part of that. Although Maharaji said to us, these people don't need yoga, they can get everything through devotion. The Kundalini can arise through devotion. So, who knows? He knows. Hi, Krishna Das. Where are you? Hi. Hi. What, one of my practices, um, I look into the night sky and connect um, with the stars and the planets. And you had shared, I don't know if it was in a book or a talk, about when Maharaja was on the roof and you kind of snuck up uh, the roof to meet with him. and. He was in a deep um, connection into space. I was wondering if you can share that story. Now, that was at Dada's house. Dada was one of Maharaji's great devotees. <clears throat> he wrote this book, it's really great, called By His Grace. It's a really wonderful book. And it's on Kindle, you can get it really easy. Um, he was a communist economics professor and uh, he had no use for religion or anything like that. But his, one day he comes, his wife is getting ready to, uh, to go out and he says, where are you going? And she said, oh, we heard there's a Baba who comes to this little house across the street and we've been waiting to hear that he's coming. We heard he's there now, so we're going to see him. Good, go, go, go. So they left. His wife and aunt, they went, and they came right back. And Dada said, why did you come back so soon? His wife said, well, we came into this little hut. It was very dark inside. And as soon as I came in, this Baba turned to me and said, Kamala, go home. Your, your, your husband's friends are waiting for their tea. He called me by my first name. He never, I never met him before. So this piqued Dada's curiosity. So the next day, he goes with his wife, they go across the street, they walk into the house, and this Baba stands up, grabs Dada's hand, and starts walking across the street to Dada's house, and he says, from now on, I'll be staying with you. <laughs> now, I want you to imagine, you drive up to the stop and shop, you know, and you come out of the supermarket with a bunch of groceries, and some homeless guy comes up to you and says, from now on, I'll be staying with you. I don't think so. However, India, Babas, everything. So they walked across the street, and Maharaji, who was Maharaji, of course, comes in the house, sits down, people start arri arriving, and, you know, they had a whole thing. And from that time on, he stayed with Dada. Anyhow, um, so one time we were there in Allahabad, uh, and we were staying at, at another devotee's house, but in the evening, in the, all day we stayed at Dada's house and he fed us and everything. So one day Maharaji, uh, so I walked out onto the porch and I didn't know, but Maharaji was sitting out there by himself in the e and it was night. And uh, he was sitting in a chair, like a, you know, like a, and looking out into the, in, out, in spa into space, like up to the sky, you know? And so I, I sat down in front of him and I grabbed his foot and he just went like this, you know? And his eyes were all the veils that usually he covered his eyes with so we wouldn't burn to death when he looked at us. They were gone. And I just, I just went up. And it was like just a split second and you know, then he went, ha ah, ha, and he said, go away. So, 
I went back to the house where we were staying, <laughs> and uh, I lay down to sleep, and I went into this amazing the dream. I had a dream which was my whole life dream. It was like my whole life in one dream. It was amazing. All from that one split second with Maharaji. Dada used to say he has, he has two blankets. He has the outer blanket, which we see, but he has an inner blanket, which we don't see, that, that veils his true nature from us because we can't handle it. We, we, we'd be crisped. You know, it was just too powerful. So he, it's like a step-down transformer. Yeah. As I was falling asleep that night, one of my guru brothers was reading from a book called the Ashtavakra Gita. <laughs> and it, the line he read, I can never forget, was, on the ocean of consciousness, the ship of the universe is blown about by the winds of desire. Be not affected by these winds. And then I went right into sleep, and that, my dream started there. You can imagine where it went. It was very cool. Yeah. Hi, my name is Danielle. Hi. Good to be here with everyone and you. Um, I, was ju I heard you say that your main practice is chanting, but you have other practices. I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing them. Well, I watch a lot of television. <laughs> I drink a lot of coffee. I eat a lot of Cheerios. And I chant. I do pranayama, I do asana. One time, <laughs> one time Siddhima had told one of, the, one of the other devotees that she had to do pranayama and asanas. And so we were all in this room, and this woman is telling Siddhima, I, I can't do the asanas, but I can do the pranayama. So Siddhima said to her, yes, you just do the pranayama, Krishna Das. So from that moment on, I've been doing pranayama. Pranayam. But the repetition of the name, you know, is the main practice that I do. But I've taken all kinds of teachings because they're all Maharaji for me. He's... We're all inside of him, so all of it leads to him. That's the way I look at it. Hello. Hi. I have more of an observation than a question. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've never met you before, so um, as I'm sitting and observing and listening to your stories, the one thing that I really feel in my heart is the beauty of your storytelling and how it, it instills an affirmation in me to keep going. And I really am grateful that I was put in this place today um, to be able to hear this story and all of your stories. So I'm just very, very grateful and I really appreciate it. And I'm honored to be in, in this space. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, I have one here. Well, somebody asked my question, so I'll move on to another, which I don't even know if this is appropriate to ask, but do you have a, a goal in your meditation? Do you hope to achieve something, get somewhere, find enlightenment? Are you just on the path and you'll be on the path until you move into a you know, another way of being. I just wonder what your... Is it goal? Is that the right word even? I don't know. Yeah, you could say goal. I mean, 
generally, yes, yeah, specifically, no. In other words, when I sit down to do something or when I'm doing some practice, uh, I'm not like, I'm going to get this by right, doing right. this. Right? Yeah. But my overall desire is that I could live inside of Maharaji all the time. Be, a, be aware of being with Maharaji all the time. Oh. That's, that's the only thing I want. And how, how, uh, how <laughs> close are you, I guess? I mean, how frequent is that? Do you experience that? How frequently? You'll have to ask him. I have no idea. <laughs> but when I chant, that's the time that I feel I really enter very deeply into his presence. The presence. For me, it's his presence, but that's because I'm his boy. Right. But other people, it's just presence, being, you know, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I've got one here. Jai Shri Ram uh, Krishnadas, thank you very much for, for your presence here. So, I had the good fortune to visit Kanchidam earlier this year, and uh, I found it very peaceful sitting along those stairs, and since then I feel like going back and just sitting there and doing nothing, because it was so peaceful. And I have this now intense desire, and I keep on asking Maharaji to, that I want to be there, but uh, I'm here, um, that was a totally unexpected plan, I wasn't planning and I came here out of nowhere, the registrations were closed. So I guess my question to you is, what is the significance of being in a temple like Kanchi Dham or like, how should I view that in terms of making visits or like how it helps and practically in life um, with everything that you have? Thank you. Well, Maharaji, when he first went to that area, or I, I shouldn't say first, but he came to that area one day, and he said, I hear the sound here. There'll be a temple here. So that place was already very sacred. In fact, you know, another very great Baba lived there, had a cave there previously in the, the late 1800s, 1900s, early 1900s, Sumbhari Baba. So there was already some beautiful vibration there that was, they felt and that brought them there. Um, you just have to listen to your heart, you know. Let, let, your, let your, uh, your heart lead you and um, do what you like. Do you still go there and do you still find the same presence as if it were Maharaji's? I haven't been there for some years now. But when I'm there, I love it. It's very noisy. There's too many people now. It didn't used to be like that. When I was there with Maharaji, there was one light bulb in the front courtyard. Now there's like floodlights and it's huge. So it's very different. But Underneath all that, if you, if you can taste it, there's something else also. Yep. Yeah, just do what you want. Tell them I told you so. Nobody tells you to do what you want. Everybody tells you to do what they want. My, the last thing Maharaji said to me, my last instructions when I was leaving India is that, do what you want. It took me a long time to, to, to get to that, but first I did a lot of things I thought I wanted, and they turned to things I didn't want. Now I do what I want, and I like what I want, which is chanting with people, and watching TV, and eating Cheerios, and drinking coffee. Uh, Krishna Das, hi. Where are you? To your right. To my right. Yes, hi. Hi, my name is Jeff. Uh, I came here from South Florida. Um, my question has to do with fear. Um, 
I was going to say, don't tell him you came here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I'm facing it a little bit right now. Um, I've experienced through, man, I've tried to find relief from everywhere, from uh, therapy, I'm in recovery, I tried that road, but my fear is people. Uh, because they hurt the most, and um, because uh, it's that fear of not being good enough or not being loved or whatever that is. Um, and I know on a rational level, the teachings were all one, like there's no other, but the fear is so violently reactive, and I've been trying to practice for so many years, and it's still like looking a stranger in the eyes for longer than about two seconds or having a genuine connection with anybody that I don't know very, very, very well is the most terrifying thing in my life. And I'm just trying to find a way to not do that or have any practice that even just catches before the fear hits, before the reactivity hits and I run away or get scared and close off or whatever that looks like. I don't know if you have any advice, but that's what I've been struggling with for a long time. Well, it's very brave of you to stand up and talk like that. I don't think there's one thing you can do, there's no particular button to push to make it all go away. But you just keep being aware of it, you know. Uh, there's a book called... Uh, what's Mingyu Rinpoche's first book? Joy of Living? Yeah, get that book. Joy of Living. You have it? I read it. You read it. Good. Good. Read it again. <laughs> you, yeah, whatever it takes. Yeah, and then read it again. Because he, had, he was in a similar situation. He had these panic attacks out of nowhere. He was raised as a, a reincarnated tulku, a lama, a, you know, and he was treated like a prince his whole life, and yet he had these panic attacks, and he couldn't do anything and then he had to go in retreat for three years, isolation, except with a teacher. And he had to find a way, to, and he did. And he explains very carefully what that process is and how it works. Um, and one thing that he talks about is that the real problem was the panic about the panic. So I think it's very similar. The real problem, the thing that paralyzes you the most, is the fear about the fear. And the fear itself is just a feeling, but the panic about that, oh, how's it going to be? That's very paralyzing. So, um, yeah. Counseling, therapy, you know, whatever you feel that's going to help you, go for it. It's not, you won't, I don't think you're going to find like, boom, it's gone forever, but this is your work. This is your karmic situation, you know, and it's very clear what you have to deal with. And uh, not everybody gets that kind of blessing. Most people just waddle around their whole lives and then they're dead, but you know what you have to do. That's good. So, uh, I mean, I can't, there's no one button to push, but if you could find somebody really good to work with, not just a, a, a psychological kind of 
psychiatrist kind of person, but somebody with some training in, in uh, meditation and stuff like that, I think it could really help you. But, um, Also, you know, uh, do you know the Hanuman Chalisa? Not by heart, no. But do you know how to chant it, how to read it? Can you read it? I could read it. You read it once a day, every day. Just once a day. Get a picture of Maharaji, sit with it, and read the Chalisa to him, like he's listening, because he is. So read the Chalisa to him out loud, if you can. If you're like, you know, living with 40,000 people, maybe you do it quietly. So they don't burn you to a, you know, to a stake. You're in Florida after all. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, but yeah, just sit quietly with the picture and read the Chalisa to him. And then, not only that, but read the translation. You just don't read the, the Hindi because you don't know what it means. So. Read the trans, read it in Hindi if you can, and then read the translation to Maharaji. If it takes you ten minutes, that's a long time, but do it every day. Promise? Promise. I'll punish you. <laughs> okay? Yeah, Maharaji, you know, he spoke about the Chalisa, really. He said, chanting Hanuman Chalisa can change the karmas. It's very interesting because Hanuman is the son of the wind. Hanuman is the controller of the prana in the body. And the prana flows through channels in the body. And, if those, and our emotional stuff, all our bullshit and all our pain and all that stuff is stored in our emotional bodies, which, which are actually uh, prana bodies, bodies of energy that, that flow through these channels. And if our stuff blocks those channels, it makes knots in those channels so the energy doesn't flow. And energy is just life, that's what we're talking about. So by propitiating, invoking Hanuman, we're also invoking the, the life force within us, and that will clean out, just like a river keeps flowing, it washes stuff away. That's what happens, and it's kind of like that. It's a very powerful practice. And Maharaji is Hanuman, so if you do the Chalisa, you know, get a picture of him and a picture of Hanuman, and hang out. That's the whole idea, to hang out with these beings in their space which is our real space, but we don't know it, so we, we kind of vibe with these great beings, which lifts us out of our stuff and into a deeper, warmer space, heart space. Hi, Katie. Um, just want to say how grateful I feel to be here with all of you wonderful people. Um, it's a great feeling to be surrounded in so much love. Um, I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> it's kind of a strange question, but um, did Maharaji ever talk about uh, the galaxies or space or beings that were up there to help, to help us? No, I don't. No, not like that. No. No. <clears throat> What do you think Hanuman is? I mean, he talked yeah. about Hanuman all the time. Right. But when he talked about Jesus, that was a different thing. Mm-hmm. When he spoke about Jesus, you just, it, it was too strong. Even he, like, the, where is Raghu? Is he here? I'll tell the story the wrong way again. So Raghu came to, there he is. But I'm going to tell it my way because it works better. It's, I don't care how it really happened. So Raghu comes. And he doesn't know about Maharaji, how he is, you know, how, how it is there. So uh, Maharaji says to him, what do you want? Why did you come? So Raghu said something like, you know, well, could you teach me how to meditate? And Maharaji said, ah, can, 
going back with the other crazy people, the Westerners, go away, go away. And as he's walking away, he said, just meditate like Christ. So he comes in the back, and he, you know, we debrief him, because anybody who spent one second with Maharaja, what do you say? You know? And then what? So then, uh, so later on, he came to the back to sit with us, and we're all there, and Ramdas says to him, you said we should meditate like Christ. How did he meditate? Right? Don't you, you know, you would think, okay, I got my little book out, and I'm going to write it down. So, it look, he was about to say something, it seemed, and he just stopped. And his eyes closed. And he sat in front of us, completely still. He was never still. He was throwing fruit to everybody, barking orders to the people who ran the temple, talking to ten people at the same time. You know, all of a sudden, boom. And as he was sitting there, two tears came down his cheek. And he kind of shook himself, opened his eyes, and he said, he lost himself in love. That's how he meditated. He lost himself in love. He never died. No one understands. He's one with the, with the universe. He lost himself in love. Hi, my name is Julia. Um, I was just curious if um, you do ever, I didn't see any short uh, mantras in my notebook, and you were saying the, the key is repetition. I just wondered why you don't do any shorter ones. Cause <laughs> I'm kind of new to this, and, and it, some of them are really complicated, and you know. Like what? What are you talking about? What's complicated? Well, the, the, the pronunciation of You mean what we sing? You're talking yeah. about what we sing? I do do short mantras, I just repeat them endlessly, so they sound like long mantras. Okay. Ram, Sri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, is that difficult? No, I like that one. <laughs> see, see, okay. And O oh, Clean, but you haven't done that one. Which one? O oh, Clean. O oh. Clean. Clean? It's a, it's a mantra, I listen to on YouTube. It's a beige mantra, yeah, I don't do those, because you blow up if you do it wrong. <laughs> And, and one more question. Like did you, you. What? Did you do daily mantras with um, Maharaji? You mean in India? In the old days? We sang to him every day, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Did you never talk about that? I just wondered. Yeah, every day was different. You should read this book called uh, Love Everyone. And, uh, this, our friend Parvati, who was there with us, she brutalized us until we sent her our diaries from the old days. And then she put together all these diaries and recreated what it was like to be there with him day after day. A really great book. Love everyone. Parvati Marcus. You okay? It's a short mantra. Don't worry. Hi, it's bit, oh, sorry, so loud. It's Bill. Um, you answered part of my question just now in a beautiful way, but I just wanted to say that this Easter, we had a retreat with a dozen um, ministers and priests and divinity professors to recreate the Easter ritual. Mm -hmm. And to begin it, we played My God is Real, uh -huh. the long version. And it I made such a... No, there was a long an, version. Okay. Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay. And it made such an impression that one of them who was spent five years with Mother Teresa washing bodies and is a death row chaplain vowed to listen to it every day for the next year. Poor guy. Uh, no. <laughs> so what I was just going to ask is, this is such a beautiful, the Christian imagery in this is one of many examples of how you, your, your chanting reveals all is one, right? And I was just curious about um, the Christian imagery and some of your most beautiful chanting and, and what, you know, what, what you were thinking about when you were doing that. I probably wasn't thinking. 
I, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what you mean even, you know. It just, it just comes out the way it comes out, I don't know. You give him the mic back for a second? Please. It was not a good question, but what I really wanted to say is thank you <laughs> for doing that. And from Praise the Lord. Hi. Um, my friend and I have both been to retreats in Maui before when Ram Dass was still in yeah, his body. Yeah, you're part of the usual suspects, yeah. I know. Um, and so we were commenting, like, this is really wonderful and it feels so, like, nourishing and we really miss him. Yeah. It's palpable, the difference. And I remember the story he told about when Maharaji left his body and somebody asked about his grief or if he missed him, he says, no, because he's with me all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering for you, do you miss Ramdas <laughs> like I do? <laughs> well, <clears throat> yes and no. I mean, I miss, the thing I miss the most is making him laugh. I, I used to really be able to make him laugh. That was great. Like um, one time, Mondays was the day he used to go to the, the ocean and he'd go float in the ocean. And it was the only time he was free from the weight of his body. I mean, he'd been in a wheelchair for 20 years. <clears throat> so I usually followed a little later because I just get up later. So when I got there, usually they're already in the water. So as I was walking to the beach, I looked and I saw him sitting alone in the parking lot in, in, in a car. And the, the door was open where he, you know, by the passenger side. And he was just sitting there and he was, had this look on it. He was like, like that, you know? So I walked up, and he looks at me, and he looks at me, and then he says, I'm a fake, and you're a fake too. <laughs> so I looked at him and I said, yeah, but we're real fakes. He just, he almost fell out of the car. It was a great moment, you know? Yeah, that part I missed. The rest, you know, it was like, isn't there a country song that, how can I miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> Something like that, you know? Must be. The, the remembering is, is the presence. That's the path. That's the practice. You think you miss him, but you're actually, he's remembering him. But you're just caught on the, on the grief side of it. As soon as that grief passes away, you enjoy the presence. But that's part of that. It goes back to the other question about whether we should work on ourselves or not. You see, we're not used to letting ourselves feel good. We don't know how to do that. We work so hard, I'll meditate and then I'll feel good. No. I mean, I'll do this, then I'll feel good. Yeah, for a minute, you know. We're just not, our natural state there's this okayness, which is our natural state. We're okay in there. But we lost touch of that with that. And all we're trying to do is get back to that. Reconnect with that basic goodness, the basic okayness. So when we let ourselves feel that, then everything's cool. And everybody's here. So. And yeah, here in the front row. Uh, yeah, so I have many questions, but I'll ask one, which is to do with the part where you said it's about the livelihood and do what you love. And I love doing nothing. It's like really fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think that's just... It's not possible. Even when you're sitting there thinking you're doing nothing, you're still thinking you're doing nothing. So that's something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the beauty of it. If you could really do nothing, that would be very good. Yeah, that's the misfortune that I have to keep doing something. Right? Everybody has karma. We're impelled by our karmas. There's no getting away from it. That's the truth. Yeah. Oh my God, you answered my question. I have no more questions then. Good. So that, that's my work. I have to keep working on it. Okay. 
Yeah, so when nothing is left, then everything will be there. Hi, Katie. Where are you? Hi. Um, thank you very much for every single word. And I just wanted to bring up the, the team of this meeting, right? It's the gathering, the tra transaction between bhakti and Buddhism. And somewhere in your blog, one time, I read a story about Lama Norla Rinpoche. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about him <laughs> and Maharaji? <clears throat> uh, Lama Norla was a Tibetan Lama, obviously, who escaped from Tibet. And uh, what year did he say it was? 62 or 63. He was wandering around northern India alone. He, he didn't know where anybody was, his people. He had a, a little pot to cook with and some flour and sampa. Hello? Jesus, calling out. So, um, um, <clears throat> so Lama himself told us the story. So he was wandering around the hills near Hardwar, and he saw this broken down kutir, this little hut. So it was abandoned, so he moved in put his stuff around and was just getting settled when this somebody this guy shows up and starts yelling and screaming at him and kicking his stuff around broke his pot and everything you know and then he left so lama thought well maybe he's the owner maybe he doesn't want me here but i have no place to go so i'm just going to stay so sometime later, a bunch of Indian people came with, with uh, chai and, and, and nashta, you know, food, and said, gave him some food. And then they said, there's a Baba who lives here. He wants you to come for dinner, for a meal. So Lama Norla went off with them, and there was the guy who was yelling at him earlier in, in, the, in, the, in the hut, and it was Maharaji. And Lama Norla said, he kept me with him for two years. He, if he went away, he made sure I had a place to stay and somebody fed me and took care of me. And he said, after two years, and uh, Lama said he was the greatest Siddha in the Himalayas. And uh, he told a bunch of stories. But after two years, one morning, early in the morning, Lama said there was banging on his door. He opens the door and Maharaji is there. And he said, don't listen to them. Don't, whatever they say, don't listen to them. And then he went away. So, later in the day, Lama Norla's guru's brother arrives there to bring Lama Norla back to Darjeeling, where his guru had set up shop outside of Tibet. Because Lama Norla had been run his meditation retreats. So Lama goes to Maharaji and says, Baba, they, they want me to go back. Maharaji says, oh, don't go. Don't go, we love each other so much, we'll be together our whole lives, don't go. He used to call him Tibeti Baba. We'll be together our whole lives. And the Lama says, but Baba, he's my guru. You must go. You must go, if you don't go, your sadhana won't bring fruit, you have to go. Then Lama says, but Baba, we'll meet again. Maharaji says, huh, yes, we'll meet again, but after you die. So. Last time I saw him was just a few years before he died, the Lama. And he looked at me, he goes, Sitaram, Sitaram. <laughs> and his, his disciples were looking like, what is this, you know? And then he started, he, hadn't, he had one, this much of his lungs were still working. He was on oxygen, he hadn't gotten out of the chair for days. The minute I walked in, he starts going, oh, feed him, feed him, Sitaram, Sitaram. You know, it was too funny, you know. But uh, he loved Maharaj very much. Yeah. Hi. Um, aside from uh, here and in our hearts, are there any places, like physical places, where uh, Maharaji or Ramdas can, their presence can still be felt? 
There's nothing aside from the place in your heart, period. Everywhere you go, that's where you are. And wherever you feel it, in your heart. So don't wander around looking for anything. Unless you want to. Thank you. If you want to wander, I mean, I, don't let me stop you. Hi, Howard. Over here. Yeah. Um, my question, well, first, uh, frame of reference. When I started this path, like, four years ago, I uh, met Ram Dass because somebody talked to me about Ram Dass. I live in Mexico. I came all over from Mexico with my couple. So uh, I started to listen to Ram Dass, and suddenly Ram Dass talks about uh, the Hanuman Chalisa. Mm -hmm. So I thought that's a message for me. I need to learn that. So I Google it, and Nina wrote up, uh, up, appeared in a video, so I started to study the Hanuman Chalisa, a whole summer, and became a pretty important part of my life. Hanuman became something like pretty important for me. So uh, I started to understand the connection between Ram Dass and, and Hanuman, but I didn't understand the connection between Hanuman and, and and Nim Karoli Baba and Ram Dass, and for me it was like this weird old man, you know. And, but <clears throat> uh, with the time, uh, keeping studying the Hanuman Chalisa and cultivating in my heart, uh, someday I feel the, 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 the presence of the Guru, I, and I understand the connection, but it's hard for me to understand how to deal with these four people that is the same people, so my question is, how do you deal in your sadhana, in your singing, or how you say whatever you do? Uh, you sing to Ram, you sing to Hanuman, uh, you sing to your uh, guru. How does appear to you, and how do you deal with, with this energy in, in the form of a lot of people? When I sing, and I notice I'm not paying attention, I pay attention. And then I'm not paying attention, then I pay attention. I don't sing to any particular thing or any particular person or any particular feeling. I sing, I listen to the sound of the name. When I don't pay attention, I come back. That's all I do. I don't visualize anything, I don't manipulate my emotions, I don't try to feel anything particular. I don't try to do anything except pay attention and sing and have a good time. And all these people you mentioned, including yourself, are only one person. So, uh, if, I, if, if I was to say what I sing to, I would say I, I sing to enter more deeply into the presence of love. But that's about as far as I'll go. Yeah. Understanding for me once was like my heart is like a hotel, and I have a room for Ram Dance, I have a room for... Nim Karoli Baba, I have a room for Hanuman, and I have a room for myself. That was the understanding. When the thing burns down, all of them will get burnt in the same place. All right. <laughs> and you'll still be there. But that's good. It's a little bit too much thinking, that's all. Hello, I'm Ella. Where are you? Where are you? Oh, back there. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm in Miami, and I'm grateful to be here with you all. Um, when I was seven years old, I... I was already 90 at that point. <laughs> I'm 43. So um, I, I connected with the suffering of animals when I was seven mm -hmm. and stopped eating them and started understanding and researching back when there was like no internet and um, finding out about modern animal agriculture and Ever since then, and I'm 43 now, so that's a long time, um, there's just a, a heaviness in my heart. And I knew it was my purpose on earth to give a voice to animals. And I love all the chanting and um, the connection in Buddhism and Hinduism and about all beings. And, and yet I sometimes feel like they're not so much a part of the conversation. Um, and my heart hurts a lot, like every day. And being around meat and dairy and knowing what 
those animals went through and the suffering, it's, it's hard. It's hard to live sometimes. Um, and I do my best to spread my message of compassion, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that and how to handle that, that heaviness that I feel, and, and knowing that I see the world through a very different lens since I was very young, um, just including animals just as much as people in that suffering, and mm -hmm. any comments you had on that? You know, in the Bhagavad Gita, when uh, Arjuna <clears throat> is about to fight. It's a war, a big war, a lot of people are going to die. So he asks Krishna to take him up on this hill between the two armies so he could get a look at everything. And he gets up there and he looks and he sees on both sides are his family, essentially. His cousins, his uncles, everybody, both sides of the armies, both armies are full of his relatives. And he says, I can't do this, I can't fight. There's no way I can do this. And he drops the bow, you know. And Krishna says to him, he says, oh, he said, your words seem to be very wise, but are they really wise? And then Krishna takes him through every single level, and finally he reveals to him his, his universal form, the reality of things. And inside of that, all beings are entering into Krishna, and all beings are coming out again through Krishna and reincarnating. It's an endless cycle of birth and death, all beings, not just human beings, all beings. And at the same time, nothing is happening. There is no movement. Krishna says, I come as time, the great destroyer. Everything is within time. And he continues on through the different chapters, and he winds up saying to Arjuna, you do what you do, but you relinquish the fruit of your actions to me. So you are causing yourself suffering. It's an emotional thing that you're doing to yourself, and you're not helping anybody with that. To fight the battle fully, you have to give up needing it to, to be the way you want it to be. You have to recognize things are the way they are. They're not the way you want them to be. All you can do is the best you can do, but that should not include hurting yourself and living in any kind of pain because of that. I hate to say this, but there was a great Lama who called this idiot compassion. It's not real compassion. Not that you don't feel for these beings, you do. But the emotional aspect of it is a negative thing, that you're, you're hurting yourself, you're not allowing yourself to blossom. And as a result, you're not able to really fully engage in the battle. If you can really be present in the moment and fight the battle fully, you don't think about the future. You think about now. What am I doing now? How can I do this better? You don't think about the future, how it's going to work out. That's what we can't control. All we can control is what we do in this moment. And even that, to a large degree, is programmed. So, uh, you know, I haven't eaten meat for over 50 years. When I quit the basketball team and stopped getting free burgers, that was it. But it's good work you're doing. But if it's not making you happy, Feeling bad is not, a re it's not required for the path. It's not, it's not a requirement. You can feel okay and still be with the suffering. And that might take a little practice, but that's the, that's the way it can be. And if you really want to be effective, that's the way it has to be. So you should really take a look at yourself and, and honestly look at yourself and 
what's going on here? You know, why is this so sticky for me? Why am I not letting myself blossom? And even because, listen, it's not just the animals that are suffering. Everybody in samsara is suffering. People next door are dying. People next door are this and that. Everywhere you go, people are suffering. If your work is with animal beings, fine. But do you have to, do you have to f suffer yourself because of it? That's not real compassion. It's, it's good. I mean, it's, it appears to be good, just like Krishna said to Arjun, your words seem wise, but are they really wise? And then he says, you see, all these beings, he said, that you're going to fight, they're already dead. Because for us, everything is in time. But there, in Krishna, it, he, it, he is time, so to speak. So there's no coming and going, there's no birth and death. It's already happened. So you want to kind of liberate yourself from the emotional aspect of it so you can really be of use and really help whoever you want to help. You know, you don't have to feel bad. But you can if you want. Krishna Das. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Just, I think the mic. I'm going to take that battery out of that machine. <laughs> I know. You hate, you hate when I do this. <laughs> it is that time. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it goes all the time. <laughs> In time. Well, one more question. Up to you. I don't know how to do one more question. <laughs> Who has a life and death question? Okay, well, she's come walking to the front. Okay, <laughs> oh. Where's my bodyguard? I don't know that it's life and death, but... Um, okay, so... Uh, um, I have a question, but first it's about your story around cocaine. And all around round my brain. <laughs> Had you already started your spiritual journey sure. at that point? I've, okay. I've been with Maharaji, I've done a million things. Okay. Yeah. okay. I didn't get fucked up until after I came back from Maharaji. That's when I got really bad. That's when I had the strength to really fuck myself up. Mm. Before I was too scared. Mm. And then when I came back, the shadow just ate me up after he died. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is my question, because for those of us who don't have a guru that's like, stop, don't do it anymore. Um, for me, I started the spiritual path and had been on it for many, many, many years before I picked back up certain substances. And about two weeks ago, I realized I have been, I had been smoking pot every single day for longer than I could knew. And it's been troubling to me. Like, how did I get, how have I gotten caught in that substance addiction loop again? Mm -hmm. And so for someone, again, who doesn't have someone that's like giving the force field and telling you don't ever do it again <laughs> and then you just stop, <laughs> what could you offer um, one time, Maharaji, uh, he told us not to smoke hash. He said, if you smoke hash, it, it, it's bad for your health. He said, if it really worked, I'd put you in a room full of it, and I'd come in and we'd all smoke together. <laughs> there are, you know, there's sadhus that do smoke hash all the time. They live outside. It, it keeps them from the cold. It, it's part of their practice. But he wasn't, he didn't really approve of that for most people. One time he, he told me, I, I wasn't a big smoker, but I smoked a little bit. So one time he, he, he said, told me not to smoke anymore. And I, and I thought, okay. And then I said, but wait a minute, this is, can you imagine, you know, I'm in India, I'm standing there in a red dress and, you know, barefoot. And I said, well, what, what happens if like I'm back in America and I'm at a party and somebody gives me something to smoke? And he just looked at me, ah! <laughs> 
if you can't do something like this, how will you ever find God? And he slammed the window in my face. <laughs> it's not the worst thing you could do, but, you know, it's not very good for you. It's self, you're self-medicating. Why don't you sit with that anxiety that you're trying to medicate out of your life? You know, that's all you're doing. It's just self-medication. Find out what it is you're medicating. Why are you medicating? What is it you can't deal with? And then, you know, of course, it's not addicting physically, really. It's a mental addiction. You can give it, uh, you know, uh, marijuana is not a physical addiction, I don't think, right? Right. So it's mental, emotional. Whatever it is you're having problems dealing with, that's putting the kibosh on it for you. And so, if you could find out what that stuff is and work on that, then you could really smoke and have a good time. <laughs> and it wouldn't matter. But right now, you're using it to bypass some stuff inside. So, you can do it. Yeah, I know. How about a round of applause for Krishna's <laughs> live chat time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, do you want to take a little time in the evenings to do some Q and A?